Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening. Welcome from whatever time zone you are in the world. <laughs> I am in Pacific time, so it's 7.30 in the morning here. So it's a little early for me, but I've had some coffee. I have more coffee right here, just in case. Uh, and I'm actually thrilled to be able to do this talk for you, even if it is quite early here. I'm Sarah May, and I am a software architect at Salesforce. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about making a career out of your jobs. And so before we begin, I wanna give you three caveats. And the first is that this talk is not about what I do at Salesforce, like at all. <laughs> this talk is about crafting your career and thinking outside of the box of any one particular job. As a result, I'm not gonna tell you very much about what I actually do at Salesforce other than to say, like the slide says, that I'm a software architect. So I write code, I think about systems. And right now I'm writing code and thinking about systems in the context of design systems. We have our open source lightning design system. So if you're interested in design systems at Salesforce, hit me up later um, because this talk doesn't have any of that. So that's the first caveat. Uh, the second one is, as Michael mentioned, this talk is not 45 minutes long. Uh, I think we're scheduled here until 11.15 Eastern, 8.15 Pacific. And I expect us to have plenty of time for Q&A within that block. Um, and if nobody has questions, you can have some time back at the end. Uh, however, if you have a question that you don't wanna ask publicly or that you think of later, here's my contact info. This is my email and my Twitter. Feel free to send me an email or a DM um, at any time. And I'll put this slide back up at the end when we take questions. Uh, and the third caveat is so important that I made it into its own slide. <laughs> and that is that we are living in weird times right now. Things are hard. This is actually the second time that I've done this talk. And the first time was at the end of March of this year. And at that point, we had all just started working from home. And it felt like we were in the middle of three simultaneous worldwide crises. A health crisis with COVID-19, of course, a racial justice crisis here in the United States, and a global leadership crisis centering around climate change. And here we are six months later, and we are still in the middle of a worldwide health crisis, and we are still in the middle of a racial justice crisis, and we are still in the middle of a global leadership crisis. And most people in the tech industry are still working from home, haven't seen their company desk in six months. Most schools are still closed. My two kids are doing virtual learning from home, ask me how that's going. <laughs> and in the US, more than 6 million people have lost their jobs in the last six months. And so with everything that's going on, I think it's fair to ask, should we even be talking about our careers? Is this even appropriate? There's so much that's going on beyond our own stories. And that's a fair question. But all this upheaval is, I think, all the more reason to talk about ways to shift the narrative in our career. I've lived through a number of these cataclysms in my career since I started working in the mid 90s, the popping of the first internet bubble, 9-11, the economic collapse of 2008. And situations like this, events like this, um, always make a lot of people step back and ask, am I doing the right thing? Is my effort going towards something that's important? Am I going in the right direction? And if not, how do I change that? And this is a talk about changing your career narrative with open source. So, excuse me, I think the talk is actually quite timely um, because lots of us are looking for ways to make meaningful contributions to society with our work. And fundamentally, that's what this is about. So with those three caveats out of the way, let's start with two words, jobs and career. We often try to think of them together, right? What is my career, you might ask, <laughs> but the list of the jobs that I've had. But it can be very useful for us to consider these two concepts separately. So let's start with jobs. Everyone has a list of jobs, usually on LinkedIn or in a PDF resume in a long forgotten folder on your laptop or on a personal website somewhere that hasn't been updated in three years. Um, specifically for this talk though, when I say the word jobs, I mean something a little bit different from the stuff you list on LinkedIn. Because what you list there tends to be like companies or organizations that you've worked for. But you may have had one or more than one job within each company. 
a word that's maybe a little closer to what I'm talking about is roles. I think of each new situation you go into where you're learning new things and making different use of your past experience as a new job, whether or not it's at the same company uh, or at a different company or some combination. They're all jobs that you have over the course of your career. Now, fundamentally, your list of jobs is what shows up on LinkedIn, as we mentioned, or a resume, right? It's public, it's outwardly facing. It gives people an idea of what you've done. Your career, on the other hand, is, an, is a concept. It's a narrative. It's, it, it's an inwardly facing idea. It's for you to help you make sense of what you're doing and where you're going. Your jobs are a part of your career narrative, of course, but there's a lot more to it than that. I think of a career as a story arc, um, as a narrative. You'll hear me say that a lot. It describes what you're here to do. I don't mean here like at the conference or here in your present role or here at your present company, but here in the world to do. And your jobs are points along that arc, but they aren't the whole thing. Right? Your career includes schooling and training. It includes childhood events that led you down a particular career path, maybe inter actions with an influential mentor or a teacher you're really connected with. And then of course, crucially for this talk, it also includes volunteer work and side projects and other activities that you do aside from your job. And it all makes up this story. And this story, of course, isn't something that just happens to you. You're writing it. You can influence it. You can bend it towards what you want. And each of these elements are knobs you can turn or levers you can push to change the direction of the narrative. Now, it's true that jobs are the big spots on this arc. So you might ask, why do we bother to talk about all this little stuff, side projects, open source, blah, 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 when just getting the right job has the biggest influence on the direction of my career? Shouldn't we focus on that? And we could if we lived in an ideal world where having a job wasn't tied to basic survival, right? In an ideal world, we would never have to unexpectedly look for a new job. And in an ideal world where we started feeling like we wanted something new to do, we'd have all the space and time and energy and resources to really look for and wait for the right job that moves us directly forward in our goals. But most of us don't live in this ideal world. Most of us sadly have to participate in capitalism to survive. And in our world, being out of work is a fraught and scary situation. It's connected to money, survival, and in the United States to health insurance. We all have different situations and sometimes we don't have the liberty to wait for the perfect job that gives us all that survival stuff and moves us along in our career narrative. Sometimes we just need a job. And sometimes the best job is just the one that's available, whether or not it feels like it's moving us forward in the story. And I just wanna acknowledge that, that we don't always have the privilege to wait for exactly the job we want. But it doesn't mean that your career arc is not in your control because you have these other levers besides jobs to move the narrative of your career in the direction that you want, right? Remember side projects and volunteer work? These we can wait for. We can try different ones to see which one feels most like it's moving us in the right career direction. And those small changes and the little things that we learn make us ready for the next job or role transition, right? It gives us a higher likelihood that when we need to, we'll be able to efficiently find a job that offers both survival and career growth. Now, side projects and volunteer work may feel like small levers in comparison to your job. After all, you spend eight hours a day at your job. And how much realistically can you really put into a side project and volunteer work, right? An hour a week or two at best. But these small levers can really have an outsized effect on your career, even if they seem small compared to your jobs. Now, I wanna give you an example from my own career to make this more concrete, <laughs> because there are many people out there who will tell you, do side projects, it's good for your career. Participate in open source, it's good for your career. Uh, and when I hear that, I often think about an episode from the TV show South Park from long, long, long ago. I don't know if we have any South Park fans in the room, uh, but they had a bit that they called the underpants gnomes and the underpants gnomes had a business plan and here's how the business plan meant. Uh, they made a deck as you do when you have a business plan. So here's the slide. Phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, question mark. Phase three, profits. 
And I feel like telling people to work on open source because it's good for their career is kind of like this, right? It's like phase one, work on open source. Phase two, question mark. Phase three, it's good for your career. Uh, but they often kind of leave out the how part, right? The phase two is all kind of vague. And let's assume that you're not gonna be the one tenth of 1% of developers who are paid to work on open source. So how exactly does open source help you? And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk about um, an incident in my career, uh, even though I've never been paid to work on open source, and that's not really a direction that I'm interested in going. Um, you, working in open source actually did have a huge effect on my career, despite the fact that uh, that's not actually what I do for my day job. Uh, specifically because uh, this is open source, of course, instead of volunteer work in general, I'm going to talk about how open source did this for me. And the project that I'm going to talk about is called uh, Diaspora. And in order to understand how this happened, we need to uh, cast your mind back to 2010, which is literally a decade ago at this point. It's 2010, we're two years into Obama's presidency. And it's only been three years since the first iPhone was released. Um, in 2010, four computer science students from New York University go to a lecture by a man named Evan Moglin, who is a well-known lawyer who specializes in free and open source software issues. And in this lecture, a decade ago, Moglin advocated for alternatives to centralized corporate controlled social media like Facebook and Twitter. He wanted the people who use these platforms rather than a corporation to have control over their data. What a concept. Uh, and he asked the audience to start building these things. And so these four students went back to their dorm uh, and started thinking, hmm, maybe we should do that. <laughs> it was approaching the end of the spring semester. Summer was coming. None of them had gotten internships yet. So they decided to do a Kickstarter and ask for money to work for three months on creating a federated social network that would give people control over their own information. And that project was what came to be known as Diaspora. Now I need to talk a little bit about the structure of the system in order to understand this. So a federated or distributed system looks kind of like this, right? As opposed to Facebook, where, which would be one giant pile of cubes in the middle, right? Each of these nodes are a separate web application with its own data store, its own code base, and its own residents. And residents can be friends with other residents that are in their node, but they can also be friends with residents of other nodes while retaining control over their data because it's local. And so the lines between these nodes are the federation part, the sending of messages between nodes when, for example, you post a picture of your cat, it gets federated or copied out to all of the nodes where you have friends so that they can see it. Sounds like an easy problem that four undergraduates can knock out in the summer, right? <laughs> Guess you gotta start somewhere. So they posted a Kickstarter and they asked for $10,000 to pay rent, eat ramen and write software for the summer. But they got $200,000 instead of the $10,000 they asked for. Now this seems a bit like old news at this point, but a decade ago in 2010, Kickstarter was a very new thing. I think they actually knew one of the founders and that's why they used it. And this was the first project ever on Kickstarter to be so overfunded. And so they received an enormous amount of attention just for that. But they also hit the timing exactly right on the topic because Facebook was being more terrible than usual when they did this. And people really wanted this to exist. And so because of the topic area and because of the drastic overfunding situation, it generated an enormous amount of media attention. Suddenly they were in the New York Times. They found themselves minor celebrities being recognized on the streets of New York, if you can believe that. So they knew they had to get out of New York to get any work done. One of the guys had an older brother who worked at a small consulting company in San Francisco called Pivotal Labs, which at that point was about 40 people working in a big open office space. And through that contact, Pivotal offered the diaspora guys free desk space. So they escaped from New York and they came to San Francisco where uh, they were incubated, I guess you could call it, which pretty much meant that they hung out, mostly kept to themselves, and ate our food in quantities that only starving college students can achieve. Because if you, as you may have already guessed, Pivotal Labs was where I was working at the time, and this is where I met them and first got interested in working on their project. But as I mentioned, they kind of kept themselves, so I didn't get involved in the project right away. 
uh, I got involved at the end of the summer, so maybe three months into this project. They released what they had so far to GitHub, which prompted another wave of media scrutiny. Uh, scrutiny. Um, you should have seen the comment threads on Hacker News and Reddit. It was just comments for days. Um, and the day they released it, I was on my way to a conference. So I cloned the repository in the airport. I started looking at it. And before I got on the plane, I tweeted about how it really didn't have very many tests. And I should say at this point that a decade ago, Twitter was really still mostly software people. And most of the folks who followed me were other software engineers, like mostly people I actually knew. And so I didn't figure that it would be noticed much among the rest of the media circus. Um, but when I got off the plane and I turned my phone back on, I had an email from GitHub notifying me that I'd been given commit access to the repository with the note, yes, we know we don't have that many tests. Could you please fix it? <laughs> and Diaspora was a Ruby on Rails app, which is the sort of code I worked on for Pivotal Lab, uh, for Pivotal clients, right? And I knew a lot about testing for someone who's not in the QA space, so I saw an opportunity to contribute something that I knew a lot about to this project. I saw a gap that they needed someone to fill because they don't teach testing in CS programs these days, I guess. Uh, and my knowledge and experience was a good fit. And of course, uh, over the years, as I got more involved in the project, eventually ending up on the core team, I did a lot of other things as well. For example, I moved them off of MongoDB to MySQL, um, which was also something I had done for several Pivotal clients. So the project felt like it was moving me in the right direction though, because there was one aspect to it that I was completely unfamiliar with. And that was the federation or the distributed system nature of Diaspora. Pivotal's clients wanted web applications. So the projects I worked on for my day job were typically single web applications, of course, connected to services and APIs and so on, but just single nodes. Diaspora's code base, therefore, included all the typical web application code that I was very familiar with, but it also had code that I wasn't familiar with that dealt specifically with federating information across the network. And as a result, I helped build a distributed system, including defining the protocols, figuring out how to deal with errors, um, and encountering problems like deleting a post that were trivial in a single web app, but in a distributed system where the post had been federated to other nodes was a deep, complex, and, and very interesting problem. And the project felt right to me. It felt like it moved me in the right direction because it was something that I knew about and could contribute, namely the testing. But it was also something new for me. Working on Diaspora in my free time added a depth to my experience that really let me push my career to the next level to start dealing with systems of software and code bases rather than just with a single project at a time. I doubt I could have gotten a job at Salesforce, to be honest, without that experience. Because while there's certainly call here to work on single web applications, our big meaty software problems involve heterogeneous distributed systems that have been under construction for the better part of 20 years. Diaspora gave me the list I needed to get into systems. Um, I, I, I have discovered that I'm a good systems thinker, but I didn't really realize it until I started working on this side project. I didn't think, oh, I want to get into distributed systems, so I should work on Diaspora. I worked on it because I liked the people, because there was something I could contribute, and because I figured I'd learn something. I'd never been on the core team of a major open source project before, and let me tell you, it was eye-opening in more ways than one. Which brings me to my last point, which is that your career is a narrative, but you don't need to know how it ends. Getting involved in Diaspora opened up many new possibilities for me, but the one I capitalized the most on was distributed systems, because again, it felt right. Your career is a story and you can write it as you go. Now, some people are planners. God bless them, because I am not. I've always wanted to be, but I'm not. These are the folks who, you know, when they get that first job in tech, they have a plan, right? First, I'm gonna work for this company, then I'm gonna go to a startup, then I'm gonna get this promotion, then I'm gonna to go to this other company, then I'm gonna found a company, right? They've got this whole narrative planned out all the way to, I guess, retire to your private island or something. Um, and if you've got an end state in mind like that, that's great, right? The nice thing about it is it gives you very concrete and tangible questions to ask when you're trying to decide whether to take a job or whether to get involved in a project. Does it move me towards my goal? All right. We'll do it.
does it not move me towards my goal? I'll pass. Now I've never been one of those people. And so I do a lot more by feel, right? Does this job feel like it's moving me in the right direction? Does this project feel like a good place for me? Does it feel like I can learn something from these people? That's a big one for me. You can make deliberate choices about projects based on which one feels closer. Trust your gut, trust that you're moving ever closer to what you want, even if you don't know what that is. So in summary, I want you to use your side projects and volunteer work to shift your career narrative. And I have a little bit of advice here. Commit to a project slowly. There are a lot of good blog posts and so forth out there about how to find an interesting project. Uh, and once you do, you really want to make sure this is something that you will get something will get something out of, right? And so do a small thing at first. See how the people react. Are they welcoming? Are they happy to have you? Are they off-putting? Do they ignore you? Really make sure that you're committing to a project uh, that it makes sense for you to commit to. Then you go ahead and learn new things. Um, the great thing about open source, of course, is that it really gives you a chance to uh, stretch into areas that you may not have a chance to do in your regular job. And then step three, of course, add to the resume and then get a new role. Uh, learning these little things and doing these small projects in open source gives you uh, that depth of experience that lets you find that kind of thing if you want it in an actual job. So I hope this has illuminated a little bit what's behind the question mark in the open source GNOME business plan. <laughs> and I hope that you can now use all of the levers at your disposal, even the ones that don't look big enough, to try and bend the arc of your career narrative towards something great. Everyone's career arc will be different because we all want different things. We're all here on this earth and in this industry to do different things. But whatever yours looks like, I hope this talk has left you feeling a little more empowered to start moving it in the right direction for you. And so for me, all that remains is to say, thank you very much for having me here at All Things Open and for coming to this talk today. We do have a bunch of time for questions um, and discussion, should you want to do that. So let me first put my contact info up on the screen again. There we go. And as I mentioned at the beginning, please do feel free to contact me privately if you'd like to discuss, but I'm also open to having a discussion here and now uh, if people have questions. So if you have them, uh, you could, I believe, put them in the Q&A. Um, we have a question, uh, how might you go about finding projects to commit to? And that's a great question. Um, I think there are a number of ways to go about it. Um, and I recognize that not everyone is going to be, have the situation that I was in where uh, an open source project shows up in your office, <laughs> right? So uh, a lot of times, in other situations, what I've done is that I will look at the technology I'm working with um, or the technology that um, my team is working with, and I look for projects that are um, at least in that technology realm, right? So I have some point of reference for um, how I might contribute. Uh, another thing you can do is to, uh, there is um, a special, um, leaderboards and things of, uh, of open source projects that um, sort of volunteered themselves to be welcoming to newcomers. And they may not be in the same technology space that you're in right now, but maybe there's one that's in a technology space you're trying to get into. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember what the name of the, um, of the organization is right now, but there's an organization that has, uh, that maintains a list of open source projects that are looking for new contributors. Um, 
And another way to think about it, another way to look for projects also is to look for projects that you use in your day job um, and see if there are opportunities there you might even be able to do during work. Um, so there's a number of ways to go about it. I tend to, to evaluate projects based on people. So um, I'm less concerned these days anyway about whether or not I know the technology and more about whether or not I like the people. And the way that I determine that, because most of the time, obviously, they're not going to be in the office with me, especially not now, uh, is that I look at uh, their GitHub and I look at how they respond to issues, right? Are they, are they welcoming? Are they um, interested in people? Are they dismissive? Are they argumentative? Um, are they insulting? You'd be surprised how many of, how many uh, you you find. And basically, I filter that way. I look at how they treat their um, their contributors, uh, which is all out in the open on on GitHub, and uh, make a decision based on that. Good question. I believe there's also a chat. Let me see if I can pull that up. I don't think we have any questions in the queue right now, but um, as a reminder, um, attendees can use the Q&A window, the chat window, or they can raise their hand. So we have about uh, 15 minutes, uh, 18 minutes rather, remaining if you would like to use that for questions. Or discussion, if you have a an experience you'd like to share. Yeah, Irina has a, a interesting point here about. Um, I wasn't at the actual conference last year, but um, when conferences <laughs> come back and are a thing again. That's often, actually often a place that I find projects because you know sometimes the people are there so I can sort of evaluate um, folks you know just face to face. Um, if not, sometimes they have like little hack days or or you know hack windows of an hour or two where the core team will be in the room and you can go talk to them and see what kind of stuff they're looking for. So. Um, Certainly in-person events are a great way to try and find projects as well, um, if not really a realistic one right now. Hopefully it will be again someday soon. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A. Can I move my regular job to full-time open source development? Um, there are people who manage to do that. Um, I know several. I think the, I've never been super interested in that myself because I like, um, I like having direct customers for my work, um, but uh, the people I've seen be successful at doing full-time open source are really good at explaining why it's a business priority for the company, right? You're trying to convince the company to spend a not insignificant amount of money supporting open source through your development efforts rather than having you work on uh, you know, stuff that will make them money uh, directly. And so I think if you are going to be looking to do open source as a full-time thing, it's definitely uh, helpful to be able to present it in the terms of this is why it's a business priority um, for open source. This is why it's important for us to be contributing to this project. Um, and there are jobs like that for sure. Even within my company, I know there are some. Um, we have people who work on Kubernetes and various uh, things like that full time. And it's important for us because 
we make heavy use of these technologies. And so we need to be at the table, right? Um, but I think, yeah, the people that I've seen be successful are the ones who really can explain it in terms of business priorities. So good luck with that. Um, a question, uh, how I got into speaking and making that part of my career um, slowly over time, I think is the answer. <laughs> happy to, it's not super relevant to this, so I'm happy to talk about that later. If you'd like to send me an email or DM me on Twitter, I'll definitely can chat about that. Uh, do you have any advice about having a conversation with a boss about your career trajectory and what you're passionate about and suited for without painting yourself into a corner as someone who's about to leave? Um, I've, I've had, <laughs> I've had more and less successful versions of this in my career over the years. <laughs> um, and uh, related to this idea that uh, in order to get full-time open source work, it really helps to be able to explain the business connection to open source. I think that um, if you want to do something that it seems like your company doesn't do right now, right, for example, um, I think one way is to come to your boss with like uh, enthusiasm about the topic and maybe even curiosity, like how would this fit in here? How could this fit in here? Have you heard of anything that we're doing that might be relevant to this? Um, or coming even with like some notes prepared around like, here's how I think open source would benefit the business. Um, here's, you know, here's something I'm interested in working on that I think would be great for the business. And here's why. Um, that can often um, turn into a position where you are um, doing something new that the company hasn't done before. You know, all managers, it's funny, I just, I, <laughs> I spent about a year being a manager recently and I, I just got out of it. Um, and one of the things I discovered, this is the first time I'd been a manager at a big company. I've been a manager at a small company before, but big company managing is a whole different ball game. Um, but uh, now I'm back to being an architect, thank goodness. Um, but I think that one thing that is really helpful for managers is if you come with ideas about how this will help the business, then that makes it easier for them to sell up, right? Sell to the people that um, have the money, sell to the people that are in charge of the budget. Be like, look, this is why this is good for the business. Um, and the more you can speak that language, the easier it will be to, to be able to bring things into your job that you want to do without feeling like it, it also gives the your boss a sense that like you're not leaving you're you're looking you're not trying to leave you're looking for ways to improve the business that exists right um and so it sort of takes tends to take the the conversation in a different direction I hope that answered the question. I'm not entirely sure that it did. <laughs> so we have about um, 10 minutes left for further questions or general discussion or however the speaker wishes to use the time. We could sit here in awkward silence. That would be good too. <laughs> We have one new comment in the, uh, one new question rather in the chat window. Oh no, I'm sorry, that was already answered. Ah uh, yes, I should mention since this is a sponsored track that you should look at Salesforce open source projects because we do actually um, have a policy of, of uh, really working to um, Get new folks involved. So if you're in the, uh, um, we have a lot of projects that are um, kind of DevOps oriented, and then we also have a bunch of front end stuff. So if those are, if either of those are interesting to you, you should um, check out Salesforce on GitHub. <laughs> there we go. 
I have discharged my obligation to my employer. <laughs>